maybe a longer period of time. And as that happens, as you get a little bit more mature in your faith, you grow in your understanding. You, you learn that uh, living out our Christian faith day by day, when the enemy tries to trip you up or whatever, you realize he's a defeated foe. And when he raises his ugly head, you're able to just point out to him what the Scripture says, and uh, hopefully that will help you to stay on course as a Christian. And the third group, uh, or third stage, if you like, was the fathers, who would be the mature group. Um, those, when you mention their name, uh, you, you find yourself saying, oh, oh yeah, godly man, godly woman. Those people who just, I don't know, they portray something very special of Jesus. Now, I've said that these are the stages, but we equally said the reality is for all of us, we all kind of oscillate between these stages. We go backwards and forwards. There are times in my life now, I've been a Christian years, and um, I still need to be reminded that my sins are forgiven. And I still need to be reminded that the enemy is a toothless wonder and that he has no authority over me. And just because I've been a Christian for whatever and how many years it is, it doesn't mean that I kind of progress. Because this isn't about levels. That's the big thing to understand. These are stages. And there are stages in our lives, and that's fine. And sometimes we do go back and forth between the three of them. But they're not levels. Don't ever confuse this with levels. Because the problem that John is having to deal with is that a bunch of heretics, the Gnostics, had come in, and that's exactly what they wanted people to think. They wanted to think, oh, there are levels of spirituality, and some people are better Christians than others. So obviously those of you sat at the front here this evening are much better Christians than those sat at the back. Yeah? And if you were women, if you would wear hats, please hear me out, you would be far better Christians than you are. All right? But these are the things that we've lived with over the years, aren't they? These are the things we were taught. A lot of tosh. A load of tosh. It's got absolutely nothing to do with it. How many services and meetings you attend to the week does, in a week doesn't make you more spiritual than anybody else. That's the reality that John wants these people to understand. It's not about levels. It's about stages. And that realization as you go on in life that sometimes you do need to be reminded, come on now, your sins have been forgiven. Stop beating yourself up. What's happened has happened. Jesus loves you. He died for you on the cross. You're forgiven. 49 years of age, I still need to be reminded of that. Yeah? So, you know, that's, that's where we've been with John in this last little section. Now, John's been very encouraging. I hope you agree with me there. And endearing in this last little section. But now he's going to give us some words of exhortation. And he wants to point out, if you like, the dangers of living in the world. The real world. The world that you and I live in. Because it's not easy, is it? It's not easy being a Christian in 2016. Hello? It's not easy. We struggle. And that's the reality. And the world can be a dangerous place. And we do trip up and we do get things wrong. No wonder we need to be reminded that our sins can be forgiven. But not only see, do we have to battle with our own flesh and the desires of the flesh. Not only do we have to be prepared to fight the devil. We've got to be on our guard against the things of the world. These things can come in and sideswipe you. They can knock you right off course. If you want an example of that, do you remember what Paul wrote when he wrote to young Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 about Demas? Remember Demas? Unfortunately, he said of him, Demas, he loved the world and has deserted me. You know, I'm a huge fan of A.W. Tozer. And Toza wrote this, Every man is as close to God as he wants to be. He is as holy and as full of the Spirit as he wills to be. Now some of us will sit here this evening and push that back because we say that we want to be close to God and for the life of us we can't figure out why we're not. 
And actually, in large part, I just want to remind myself as I remind you, it's probably down to us. Because God ain't moved. And when you feel that God isn't with you, ask yourself, who's moved? And this is the key thing behind what John wants to show us now in this next little passage. Here's a synopsis of what I think John is saying in this section. When we grow with God, we'll avoid embracing the world too much. When we grow with God, we'll avoid embracing the world too much. So, without further ado, we're going to look at this next little section, and June is going to come, and she's going to read for us. Thank you, June. Our reading this evening is 1 John, chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Thank you, June. So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you open them up to this section? Because I think it's really good to be able to look at it together as we go through, if, uh, if you can. If, if you need a pew Bible, there's obviously one at the end of, of every pew. Now, you'll see there that John starts off verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's interesting that uh, the tense there indicates that this, is, this isn't something that's likely to happen. This is something that's already happening. Uh, this is something that's already going on. And, and so John is, is kind of saying here, you be careful. Don't you go loving the world too much. You watch yourself. This is an either-or deal. Much like Jesus said uh, in Luke chapter 16, no servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and, one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Now, this is a big deal to John. Funnily enough, it's a big deal to God as well. They understand, you see, that the world, the real world in which you and I live, and where we meet up with friends, and where we go to work, and where we get divorced, and where we get cancer, and where we have to deal with grief and pain and sorrow, where we struggle to pay our bills, where we go on holiday, the real world, for God and for John, isn't a passive entity. It's actually a rival for our affections and our allegiances. The world wants us. The world's after us. So James, for instance, many of the New Testament writers pick up on it, but James is a good example. He picks up on it and he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, just let me say this. Much teaching has been done on this passage in the past, and it's almost as if uh, people think that, well, what we should do then is come out and be separate, that we mustn't have anything to do with the world. Christians should just stick with Christians and uh, do everything only in a Christian context. Well, good luck to you if you think that that's what this is about. I don't believe that's what this is about. I, I think that it's, it's okay to enjoy the beauty of this wonderful world that God has made. I don't think there's anything in the rest of Scripture to counter that. I, I don't think that this is saying that we shouldn't love the world of people that God has made in His image. 
I, I think that's, that's absolutely fine. What we have to understand is that John deliberately uses the word world to, to refer to an organized system that is against God. For John, the world represents darkness as opposed to God's light. The world is under the rule of Satan for John. If you flip over to chapter 5 for a moment and verse 19, it says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Stephen Cole, I think, nails it when he writes, Worldliness is at its core a matter of the heart. If your heart is captured by the world, you will love the things of the world. If your heart is captured by the love of God, you'll be drawn to him and to the things of God. So back to chapter 2. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? Well, verse 16, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. Can you identify with that? Let's be honest for a moment. The world's a jolly nice place. And there's some great things. But John identifies three very specific threats about the way the world operates. And I think these are things that we need to take note of, especially in 2016 and as we come into 2017, because these things aren't going to go away. It's going to intensify. It's going to get even worse. With the internet now being so dominant in much of the way we shop and research things and read the news, for many of us, it's a particular problem there. But all around us, whether or not you're on the internet, television, shops, marketplaces, business, commerce, everything is colored with these things. He talks about, firstly, doesn't he, the cravings of sinful man. Do you crave wrong things? The cravings of sinful man is something we all struggle with. And John talks about that, and he says you, you need to be careful, because this is a real issue. The word cravings there is the same word that later on translated as lust in the next phrase. It refers really to all the intense and inordinate impulses that come from within us. It, it's not just about lusting after somebody of the opposite sex or whatever. It's far broader than that. It's, it's instead of doing whatever you want and fulfilling every desire you have, we've got to be under control. We, we've got to really watch the cravings we have. One of the big things today is the cravings for status, either by the kind of car we drive, the make of gadget that we buy, even the clothes brands that we wear. My dad always taught me, you get what you pay for, and that's fine. But we have to be careful and balance that with, well, what's the motivation for me to have this label? Is it because it genuinely is a great garment, or is it because it's a great name on the garment? I'm sure that's not true for any of you sat here, is it? Cravings? It's not just to do with the cravings that a man on a diet has to go through. Who's had two bits of salad? One pastor put it like this, I can admire, but I don't have to acquire. I like that. It's a good saying. I can admire, but I don't have to acquire. Now, if cravings and lust are linked, well, you know, on the sexual side of things, that's an interesting one. I can admire, but I don't have to acquire. Christian teaching many years ago from James Dobson made it very clear that the battle for adultery isn't at the bedroom door. It's here. 
with what you look at. It's a practice I've made mine for the last 20 years, is that if I see a woman who attracts me, I don't give them a second look. Quite deliberate. I don't check the mirror again to see them walking away. I don't look across the crowded room again to try and catch their eye. Why? Because I've learned the way I am, these blinking things, and especially now with these blinking things, <laughs> that's it. Cravings and lust are driven by the eyes. And so we need to watch it. Guys, I want to be honest with you. It's why the porn industry is so big. It's why the laundry industry is so big. They know that these things set us going. The cravings, the lust, it's all there. So John talks about the next thing, isn't it? He says, look, everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes. That desire, that impulse, particularly as it relates to sexual sin, but also to greed and to covetousness. Don't talk much about these problems today, but I'm telling you, they're alive and well. One test to see if you're struggling with the lust of your eyes is to ask yourself, what do you enjoy looking at? There might be lust in your life if you're fixated on something and you have a hard time of thinking about anything else. Now, that's not just a sexual thing. That could be clothes. That could be cars. It could be all manner of things. It could be exotic holidays. It could be motorbikes, Mike Bolton. I don't know. You know? There's all sorts of things it could be. We have to face up to the reality that what we see with our eyes, we very often end up wanting to have. If you don't believe me, why do you think there's such a thing as television marketing and advertisements? How many of you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren who sit in front of the television at this time of year and go, uh, I want, because they see it. Gareth will identify with that. That's the reality. So this is nothing new. You see, John is having to cope with these things back then. Here we are, 2016, 2017. You know, we think, oh my gosh, you know, they didn't know what it was like. The pressure's on us today. Come on. It's all there. It's what we see with our eyes. Job, he said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young maiden. That's the deal he made. Thirdly, John warns about the boasting of what he has and does. Oh, I told you about one pet peeve I had this morning. I'll tell you about another pet peeve of mine. People who go on and on and on about what they've got. Oh, bloody me. But some people really do boast about the things they've got. It's almost where they get their security from, their identity. It's very important for them. The desire of the flesh and the lust of the eyes refer to what we don't have. But boasting refers to what we do have. And that's a tough one to control. It's a tough one dare I say, particularly for some of you as an older generation, because you've had to be incredibly self-reliant and self-sufficient. Do you think too highly of yourself? Do you find yourself bragging about what you have, what you've done, how much better you are than so-and-so? Be careful. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. What's the antidote to all of this? Well, verse 17. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The reality is, is that the world and worldly desires, whatever they may be, are disintegrating. Things here in this world 
are transitory. Popularity is precarious, the buzz wears off, infatuation dies away, pleasure is short-lived. So the best way to keep from loving the world too much is actually to love God more. The dangerous thing about the world is that it's trying to drag us away from God. It's trying to pull us in the opposite direction. But we just need to guard ourselves to love God more. Those who do the will of the Father by believing in Jesus, living the way he wants, will live forever. We believe as Christians in eternal life that this is not all there is. So it's true what Jesus had to say, isn't it? We are in the world. You better believe it. We are, yes. But we're not of the world. We are not to be controlled by the same things as everybody else. I told you before, I've taken thousands of funerals. Never once have I seen a Pickford's van following behind me. You can't take it with you. So we need to think seriously about what our priorities are. If we're boasting about what we've got, if we're craving things and lusting after things, well, the truth is, the world and its desires will pass away. There have been many times in our marriage when Sarah and I have called a family meeting. I don't know whether you do things like this in your family, but um, if something's happened, if there's an issue in the family that we need to address, if... uh, there's been a new direction, like uh, when we left Western Supermare for me to go and work for the Baptist Union. And even, to be absolutely honest with you, though the children have technically left home, in discerning the call of God to come here, we had a family meeting. A time to be together to talk things through honestly. In many ways, I want to have a family meeting with my church family. Can we do that? Can we have a family meeting tonight? We've got five minutes before you have to go and polish the cake. And I can have half an onion or something. So, if we had a family meeting about these things that we've looked at this evening, what what would we want to say? We're all on the same team, right? We are together in this. Nobody's better than anybody else. Some of you have been Christians a very long time. Some of you have been members of this church a very long time. But we're all on the same team. We're all in this together. Some of us are Christians. Some of us are still checking it all out. Others of us haven't been Christians that long. Okay, fine. It's all right. It's fine. Others of you have been there, done that, and got the blinking t-shirt. So there we go. It's interesting, isn't it, that John finds something positive to say about individuals at each stage. Because each stage each stage displays something of Jesus' character. And I love the metaphors that John used, and I'm going to borrow one of them. It's as though all believers, whether you're a new believer or a, a, a long-time believer, all believers are walking in the light. It's just that some have been walking a little longer than others. So family, I want to remind you that we need each other. Those of us who've been at this thing a long time need those who are new. And those of us who are older need those who are younger. We need to help each other to face the realities of living in the real world. I was challenged this week by that verse in Joel chapter 2. It's quoted by Peter in Acts. And it says that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. There's a group of young people upstairs in the lounge right now. Do you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to get them down there and share their vision with us. And for us to share our dreams with them. What do you think would happen 
if they had a really good hearing from us, if we didn't just tolerate them, if we just didn't insist that things have got to be a certain way, but rather we're open to what God might be saying through them to us about vision. We need each other. We need young people to share their vision. We need to listen to the dreams of our older saints. That's how God designed it to be. I think there are some practical steps. And I want to finish with these, really. I, I, I think we do need each other. But I think that we've got to be practical about that. One of the problems is we don't know each other that well. That's the truth. When we don't know or understand somebody, we tend to either not like them or be suspicious of them. When you get close to somebody, you might find out that actually he lives with regret or she was mistreated as a child or or whatever. Maybe you discover that a young father never had a father to look up to. Or perhaps an older saint is grieving because they have a prodigal son or daughter. So for those of us who are older saints, let's try to remember what it was like for us when we were just starting out on our walk with Jesus. For those of us who are just starting out, let's seek out opportunities to learn from the wisdom of the older folk. So here's my challenge to you. If you're further along in your spiritual journey, why don't you get alongside those who aren't? Why don't you look for ways to encourage or even biblically disciple somebody? Let's avoid ageism. There's no place for us to discriminate or have prejudice towards people of a different age. But what if we were to commit as a church in 2017, as a church family, to not generalize or stereotype somebody simply because they're a certain age, but rather to try and work together, to learn from each other, to listen to one another. Mariah, I've deliberately put this picture up because it's a mix of younger and older people. And in many ways, I'm preaching to the converted, I realize that, because Mariah is quite unique. As you know, my last job, the churches I sadly visited, I mean, some churches are filled with only senior saints. And that can be very depressing. I think it's wonderful that we have a mix here. We have a mix even in our evening congregation. That's quite something. There's a mix in this chapel building right now. Listen to them. I can hear them finishing their pizza. It's good to have an age range. It's positive. It causes natural tension. What if in 2017 we committed, though, to work together so that we move forward together? And that when it comes to our ongoing ministry and mission and patterns, systems, procedures, protocols, whatever, we actually deliberately move forward together. See, I think it's helpful to realize the difference between maturity and spirituality. We are not about becoming more spiritual. We are about becoming mature in Christ. That's our goal, that's our aim. Spirituality, if you like, is the process by which we get there. Like the boy who went up to his dad and said, I want to grow to be as big as you are, dad. How can I do that? The dad wouldn't turn around to the boy and say, well, now you have to try really hard, son. I didn't get to where I am today. You know? You've got to work at it. You need to strain every sinew of your body. You need to stretch. You'll, You'll get there eventually. No, the dad would tell his son, well, you eat and, and drink properly and get some exercise and sleep. and Well, he's not going to be able to help but grow then, is he? It's going to take him time. So Christian disciplines take time. They don't just happen. So remember this morning I was talking about how do we model as parents to our children? So what if you know, the vast majority of us, not all of us in this room, are, are, you know, fall into this category, but the vast majority of us here have been Christians a long time. Why don't we model something to that lot upstairs? Why don't we deliberately, consciously model something to some of those young families that come on a Sunday morning? 
Now, you might feel that you're already doing it. God bless you. I don't think I am. Pass the plate. I want to have a consciousness. Am I making sense? About trying to model something of the way that a relationship with God develops. So that there's this understanding. We are in this together. It's not us and them. Because I think for John, there's a tension developing in that situation. That the Gnostics were saying, well, you see, some of you are more spiritual than others. 